Last session, we looked through 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10, and we talked about the idea of being united together as a church under the gospel to share the gospel. Today, we're going to take a look at how the gospel is shared. You see, Paul is going to provide for us an example in Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16, of how to be loving to our neighbors. We will see that Paul builds bridges with his neighbors. He shares the gospel because he built bridges with people around him. And he demonstrates that the church is to be united in love. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16, and find out how the church can be loving in the world around us. have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open to Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16. I want to highlight some things here as we talk about this idea of a heart that is burdened for others. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16, we read this, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Oropagus, where they said of him, may we know what what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. You know, it's really funny, the the story here, the last part, the Athenians and all of the foreigners gathered together, and all they did was talk about the latest ideas. It sounds like every social media post ever, right, some new idea. Sounds like every magazine ever, some new idea. It sounds like the news, some latest and greatest idea. I don't know if you ever keep up with some of the technology advances, not only with phones and computers, but vehicles. We, we read about the latest cosmetics, the latest clothing. We're, we're constantly keeping up with all of the latest and greatest things in the United States. But truth be told, the people, even in Paul's time, were keeping up with the latest and greatest. And although they didn't have technology like cell phones or vehicles like cars, they were talking about the latest and greatest new idea in philosophy and about the gods. I love Paul's determination here. Starting in verse 16, we see that Paul was waiting uh, for the people in Athens and he was distressed to see that the people worshipped idols. That, that word distressed, right? It demonstrates a deep passion and affection and devotion for the people. He looked all around him in Athens and he saw gods of all types, whether they were the Greek or the Roman gods or whether they were statues of some personal family deity. Maybe they were the Egyptian gods brought up from Alexandria in Egypt to different ports all along the Mediterranean. Whatever it might be, Paul was distressed to see these idols. It bothered him. It concerned him. It made him worry about the people. You see, we see in Paul's heart a a burden for others. So in verse 17, he took that burden and he went and he did something with it. As was Paul's modus operandi, his MO, in chapter 17 and verse 2, we see it was his custom that Paul went to the synagogue in the towns that he went and visited. If they had a synagogue there, he went to the synagogue first. And it was there that he reasoned with the people. We see here in Acts chapter 17 and verse 17 that he reasoned with both Jews and notice God-fearing Greeks. That is Gentiles who Judaized. They converted to Judaism. They they were worshiping Yahweh God, Elohim, the God of Israel. So Paul went to the synagogue and he proclaimed the truth about Jesus there. But notice also that a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. 
So he would go to the synagogue, and then in verse 17, he would go to the marketplace, and then in verse 18, we see that philosophers began to debate with him as well. Now, you might be familiar with Epicurean or Stoic philosophy. Epicurean philosophy is all about living the good life. I feel like that's some sort of a, a, a spoof video or some satire video, living the good life. But the Epicureans, they believed that the gods had kind of set the world up and walked away from it, and that things in the world happened by chance, that there were no gods intervening, nothing was really intervening, but rather everything happened by chance. And so they wanted to live their best life, live the good life, and enjoy what, what had been provided for them, basically eat, drink, and be merry. The Stoics were slightly different. The Stoics believed that uh, the gods weren't involved at all, and, and rather the, things happened simply by fate. You see, gods were all things, right? They were what's called pantheists. Uh, all is God. Uh, there's pantheism and panentheism. God is in all, or pantheism, God is all. And they believed in pantheism, this idea that God is all things. And, and so they, they believed in this, this philosophy of fate, that everything happened because it was simply fated to happen. They lived their lives stoically, uh, without emotion, without concern for the things around them. They tried their best to focus on just living, knowing that fate was gonna happen day to day to them. But I think it's interesting as we read here in Acts chapter 17 that Paul addressed people who believed in gods. Paul addressed people who didn't believe in gods. Paul addressed people who believed that gods existed, but that the gods were out there somewhere in the world, like modern day agnostics might believe. Uh, people who believe that God exists, but there's really no way of reaching him. It's fascinating to see that Paul, no matter who it was, had a passion and a burden for people. He wanted to share Jesus with everyone. And we see that in verse 17 and 18. In, in verse 19, these people took him to the Oropagus, the large theater where he could share all of his latest philosophy and ideas. And a large crowd of people would gather to listen to him. What an opportunity for Paul to share Jesus with a group of people who are interested in hearing all kinds of new things. You see, Paul had a heart to share the gospel. And this call is for us as well to have a heart that is burdened for other people. But we see not only here that Paul had a heart burdened for other people, but he made a point of contact with people. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Oropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everything life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appropriated times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they should seek him and perhaps reach out for him, find him, though he is far from one, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Paul made a point of contact. I love what Paul did here. So uh, back in the 1960s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, this idea of contextualization became a really important thing in the world of Christianity. Contextualization is the ability to take not only ideas and concepts, but also practices into a society and allow that society to shape and mold those practices and ideas. So, for, for example, we see Paul practicing contextualization. He takes the truth of the gospel, he recognizes the culture that's uh, 
in Athens, and he speaks into that culture with the truth. So contextualization, one of the key models was Paul Hebert. He, he created this model. It's really a four-step model, uh, but the couple of, first couple of steps are really important for us to think about. So the first step in contextualization, according to Paul Hebert, is to ex examine and understand the culture. So we live in Michigan culture, in Flint culture, in the United States culture. When we travel abroad, it's important for us to learn about the culture, other cultures, so we can fit in a little bit better. We know the culture here in Michigan, we know the culture here in Flint, we know the culture in the United States because we live it. But that's the idea, right? We, we understand, we examine, we, we learn a culture. It's really the first step in contextualization. The second step in contextualization is to know our Bibles, to know what it is that God's Word says, being able to understand the truth of the Gospel. We talked about that last week, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3, Genesis chapter 3, uh, Romans 10, 9 through 10, all, all of those verses that help us understand better the Gospel. You see, contextualization requires us to know our culture, to know God's Word, and then step three is to begin to understand the practices that people have. Do we reject the practices in the world? Do we accept the practice in the world? Or do we transform the practice in the world to make it fit with Scripture? Here we see in Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 22, that Paul made a point of contact with the people in Athens. He examined, uh, we like to use the word exegete, he exegeted, he examined the culture of Athens. He knew exactly what the people believed. Notice what he said. I see that you are religious in every way. You even have an inscription to an unknown God. Right, I see that you worship. I see that you proclaim gods. I see that you are religious. He recognized it. The second thing he did is he knew his scripture. Notice what he does in verse 24. He explains scripture to the people. So he takes their modern practice of, of knowing gods and knowing about gods and worship, and he, he brings in truth from God's word. He says the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He, he wasn't made by human hands like your idols and statues. So he begins to invert the practice of worship, saying that, that their worship is not about worshiping stone idols and statues, but rather it's about worshiping a living, breathing being, God. The God that Paul worshiped, the God that he was explaining to the Athenians, that God is a God who made all things. He made the stone that they used to carve out their idols. He made the silver that they used to smelt into their idols. He made all of the things that people worshiped. He made them all because he is the living God who didn't need anything. And notice what he says even in verse 26, from one man, he made all the nations. From one man, he could be referencing Adam or Abraham. Most likely he was referencing Adam. From Adam came all people. And notice also he mentions that God is in charge. He's sovereign. We see in verse 27 that, that he was the one, uh, or verse 26, that he was the one who blocked in history and boundaries and put people in their place. I love the way that Paul makes this point of connection. And he speaks truth into their culture. And he tells them that you need to reject your idols and worship the true God. Worship the God who made everything and who doesn't need anything. The God who doesn't need you, the God who doesn't need me, but the God who is self-sufficient in himself and he wants you and he wants me to have a relationship, not because he needs us. You see, one of the things with Roman and Greek gods is they required from people. They were very needy for being gods. They, they needed sacrifice, they needed allegiance, they needed devotion, they needed incense, they needed food, they needed all of these things, they even needed rest. You see, the gods of the Greeks and the Romans, the Egyptians, were very human in their appearance, were very human in their characteristics. But we know that the God of the Bible does not need anything. He doesn't need food, he doesn't need sleep, he doesn't need to use the bathroom, Right? He doesn't need to go to war. God is sufficient in himself. 
And though he chose to rest on the seventh day, he did it as a way to establish a pattern for humans to follow. And though he does go to war, we see in the Old Testament and New Testament, and we'll see in Revelation, God doesn't need to. He chooses to do so, to fight evil and to bring about salvation for people. God does everything because he wants to, not because he needs to. And I think that's a significant difference. And Paul is drawing that out. He makes a point of contact. And then in verse 30, he proclaims the gospel. Taking a look at verse 30, he says this, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them, uh, they sneered, but others said, we want to hear uh, what you have to say again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. And among them was Dionysius, a member of the Oropagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. You see, Paul proclaimed the gospel. He didn't simply give a testimony and leave it at this idea that they need to reject their gods and worship the true God. He explained that they need to repent in verse 29. They, or th verse 30, they need to repent. Not only that, they need to follow the true God in verse 31. Jesus is the man who's come to judge. He's the man who rose from the dead. You need to believe in that man, that God, that Savior, that Messiah. That is the truth. I think sometimes we feel that if we just live a good life, people will see our good works and come to believe in Jesus. And while they may see our good works, and glorify our Father. It's important that we speak the truth about who Jesus is, that we share with people that Jesus is the Savior, that he's the one who died on the cross, he lived a sinless life, and he rose again, defeating death, sin, and the grave. And he is the one in whom we can find salvation, no other. That is truth. So we can live it, but Paul here demonstrates that we need to speak it. We need to share the gospel. When you come across people in your workplace, it's important to build relational connection with them, to make a point of contact. So we begin with this heart of love and burden for people. We make a point of contact with them. Maybe it's over sports or TV, or maybe it's over a book you've read. Maybe it's over this, the family background or history that you have, genealogy or ethnicity. Maybe it's over food that you like together. Build a relationship, build a bridge. And then when you begin to build that relationship and that bridge, be sure to share the gospel with these people, with the people with whom you come into contact. Share Christ. Paul did that with these people here in Athens. He shared the gospel with the people who were at the Oropagus learning all of the new philosophy and history. Paul said, I want to tell you about this Jesus. You are godly people. I can see that. You worship many gods. But let me tell you about the true God, the one who doesn't need anything, the one who wasn't made by human hands. Instead, he made all things. And let me tell you about Jesus, the one who will be sent to judge the good and the bad. Let me tell you about Jesus, the one who died on the cross and rose again. And in doing so, some believe. I think there's something powerful here. We need to have a passion and a heart for people. We need to make a point of contact with people and we need to share the, the gospel with people. Those are the three keys in sharing the gospel. As a church united in love, we can be people proclaiming the truth in the world in which we live. I want to hint on one final thing here. Not everyone that you share the gospel with will believe in Jesus. I think this is important for us to realize that we are simply a mouthpiece. We are to be representatives of Christ, to be a mouthpiece for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 calls us ambassadors for Christ. We are to be those people. But that doesn't mean that we twist people's arms and force them to believe what we believe. Notice here, even in Acts 17, that Paul was rejected by some. They sneered at him. They laughed at him. They mocked him. But for the 1, 2, 3, 10, 20, 30 that heard this and believed, it was worth it. And for Paul, sharing the gospel is always worth it. 
It's not our job to convert people. It's the Holy Spirit's job to work in people. It's our job to simply be obedient to sharing the gospel wherever we go. I trust that you are burdened for people, that you make that point of contact, and that you are faithful in sharing the gospel when you need to. Thank <laughs> you.